Thank you very much. Now, returning to this evening's main debate, our final speaker on proposition uh, is George Clay. Uh, George Clay is a third-year historian at Jesus and very kindly agreed to step in at the last minute uh, to replace one of our speakers whose roof caved in this morning. George. <laughs> I'm so glad the last speaker decided to talk so much about democracy, because every time I have this discussion, it's always treated as if it's a trump card. It's always treated as if we've made a decision and now we have to stick to it, and anything less than that is patronizing. So what I want to talk about tonight is when that system can sometimes break down, when it might be the case that for the good of everyone involved, we need to reflect more on choices already taken and not take a single moment, a single day, in a single year as determinant for all of our future. I'm going to talk about choice first, and then I'm going to talk about what I think has happened to politics in this country since the European Union referendum and why I think that is something that far from celebrating, we should regret and we should regret bitterly. On choice, first of all, because they think this is a trump card. They think that because we gave the British people a choice, that should be the end of the argument. And the premise here is that we gave the British choice people, that we gave the British people a choice in the first place. I don't think that's true. I think we gave them half a choice. I think we gave them the faint beginnings of a choice. Because the choice we gave them, and the choice that was written down on their ballot paper, was should the UK remain a member of the EU? Just pick option X, or just pick option Y. Now, option X was relatively clear and relatively defined. Remaining in the EU, everyone knew that, what that would meant. It meant you adhered to the treaties of the EU. It meant you obeyed the laws of the EU. These laws and these treaties are publicly available. You could read about them in Hansard. You can read about them in libraries all across this university. You can find them online. Anyone who wants to can read them and then vote. Had remained one, no one could have argued that people didn't know what they were getting themselves into. Now that's option X. Can the same be said for option Y? I think that's a question which answers itself. Because I didn't see in the course of the referendum campaign the laws that Vote Leave drafted, the treaties that they wanted to sign, or even the vague outlines of policies which they proposed. And the reason was because they couldn't agree among themselves on what exactly their post-Brexit vision would look like. If you asked One Nation Tories, as Theresa May is now trying to characterize herself as, then she'd tell you that they wanted to preserve the integrity of working class communities, preserve their culture, prevent, preserve them and protect them from the threats of globalization. But if you asked neoliberal Tories, like Sir Edward Lee, what they want, they would say, we want less regulation, not more. We want to welcome more globalization, not reject globalization. We want more deregulation, less protection. The bonfire of workers' rights that was recently referred to by a much maligned leader of a political party in this country. The fact is that they never told us what we were voting for. They still haven't to this day. Every Wednesday morning, Theresa May is asked what her vision for the future looks like. And every day, she replies with the same slogan that Brexit means Brexit, also telling us, presumably at the same time, that tautology means tautology, although I'm sure that any part one philosophy student could tell you that for themselves. Look, the fact is they didn't tell us what we were voting for, partly because they didn't want to, it was not politically convenient for them to tell us what we were voting for, but partly because they didn't know what sort of deal we could get afterwards. What we voted for last Ju June was a blank slate, a blank slate which the British people have not yet had a chance to write on, and a blank slate which nonetheless has to be written on. The question then for this debate is who gets to shape what Brexit eventually looks like, because right now we don't know. And fortunately for some of us, less fortunately for others of us, the person who will eventually shape what Brexit looks like is sitting in 10 Downing Street right now, and that person is Theresa May. 
a woman who has given us no clarity on what exactly she wants out of this, and a woman who has given us no means of holding her to account afterwards. What this debate is really about then is, are you happy with Theresa May and the Conservative government of this country deciding for you? Are you happy with her having that kind of power? the power to totally reshape our policies on the economy, on international trade, on human rights, on immigration, on the very fabric of this country and what it means to be a member of this society. Because I'm not happy with giving her that power and I think we need to hold her to account more. No thanks, maybe later. Here is a list. I'm serious, maybe later. <laughs> Here is a list of decisions that will have to be made by this government in the coming few years as we negotiate our exit from the European Union. Here is a list of decisions on which so far we have had no concrete answer. We need to decide at some point how we're going to treat newcomers to this country, recent immigrants, people who don't necessarily look like me or have the same kind of private school voice that appeals to the likes of Boris Johnson. This, is going, this decision is going to be determined by a government which tells teachers at this university that they must spy on their Muslim students under the PREVENT program because apparently just, li uh, just living in the UK, having a brown face and studying at an English university is enough to make this government think that you're in danger of radicalization. Moreover, she, this is a woman who is currently relying for electoral support on the leader of Diane James's former partner a man who says that he was scared to have Romanians living next door to him, even though statistically, and this is a fun fact which you should all take home with you, uh, more UKIP MEPs as a percentage have been convicted of crimes than Romanian immigrants. Um, <laughs> the, the, <laughs> um, the, the, this government is being propped up by a man who is terrified to have Eastern Europeans living on the same street as him. And when he was asked what exactly he meant by this, he just said, oh, well, I'm sure you know. No, Nigel, I don't know what you mean by that. I like to think that I am not racist and that insofar as I am racist, I have the good sense to keep my mouth shut about it. So... <laughs> That is one of the decisions we are asking this government to make. But we're also giving the power over the settlement of refugees to a woman who routinely locks them in Yarlswood Detention Center, refusing to believe them when they, tell, when they say that they've been raped and assaulted. We're giving power over the economy, over trade policy, over the rights of workers and the incomes of British families to governments which have imposed years, nigh on decades, of brutal austerity and the destruction of public services on this country. And the only response we get to any of these arguments is, oh, we're sure Donald Trump will give us a trade deal soon. I mean, I mean the, the thing I really wanted to ask during the previous speech is, have you heard Donald Trump talking about international trade recently? He's not its biggest fan. He's just destroyed the Trans-Pacific Partnership and explicitly rejects any notion of international cooperation. The idea that he'll extend a helping hand to the United Kingdom and try to develop, uh, in a minute, try to develop our economy based on that is quite simply absurd. So, the first... Uh, please, go ahead. The new American government has said that they are perfectly happy and committed to bilateral trade deals. So, I mean, Mr. Trump has poured cold water over international deals, but there's no doubt across wide swathes of uh, British foreign, po the foreign Office, Department of International Trade, or the Department of the U.S. Department of Commerce, the new American administration is committed to bilateral trade deals, and they will do a trade so, deal with us. So the relevant question here is which do you think offers Britain the better deal? A 28-nation community of which we have been part for decades, or a madman who's bizarrely orange, who changes his mind on issues every 10 seconds, and who can never be pinned down to any promise that's ever come out of his lying mouth? I think I would rather trust John claude Juncker to keep his word on trade deals than I would to trust Donald Trump to keep his words on that. And it's for that reason that I think Mr. Juncker would be much better, a much better pair of hands with which to leave our economy. So, I don't think that we've really had a choice so far on whether or not 
uh, we get to shape our future relationship with Europe. I don't think that's a choice that's really been offered to us so far. What, what would a choice actually look like? It would probably look like a concrete proposal for how Brexit could actually work, uh, i.e. a settlement that was negotiated, a treaty that was proposed, and a treaty which was then voted for, either through a second referendum, which I probably support, or even just through the normal mechanisms of parliamentary scrutiny with an effective opposition and a debate which went on for the appropriate period of time. Not the joke bill of Article 50 that's just gone through the Commons against the efforts of the government which tried to suppress it by referring to the power of royal prerogative in the Supreme Court. I don't think that's much of a choice. I think for a side that so celebrates democracy, they should be giving more choice to the British people, not less. What exactly does the choice look like as it is? Leaving aside what we'd like it to look like. What is the current state of British politics, and is it really something that we think will adequately serve to protect people in our society and across the world? What have we seen happen to politics since the referendum? I think it's relatively clear what we've seen happen to politics since the referendum, and I think it's relatively clear that what that says about this government means that this government should not be entrusted with a decision of such consequence. Theresa May has run to the right on every single issue, who's pandered to the worst elements of racism, which unfortunately were on both sides of the referendum campaign, via surveillance of Muslims, via the detention of immigrants. And she claims she had a mandate for that uh, because apparently people voted for Brexit. Note that Brexit and voting for Brexit is not the same as voting for hard Brexit. A thought experiment here. If Remain campaign had won, and the day afterwards, David Cameron had announced that he's going to pursue a hard Remain policy, whereby we enter the Schengen Agreement, we enter the Euro, and we sign up to the EU army, do we really think that the Leave campaign would have been particularly happy with that? No. What we think, <laughs> what we should probably believe as a result of this, is that any acceptable settlement on leaving the EU has to contain some element of compromise, and that does not mean running to the right on every single issue. But by the way, the, the response I get to this, every time I say perhaps the government is racist, the response I get to this, and we've heard a bit of this tonight, is very interesting, because I always get told I'm out of touch. I always get told I need to respect the feelings of people who want their country back. Apparently, I need to pay more attention to the people who think their culture is dying or the people who think uh, that it's not okay to hear Polish on the street where they grew up. In essence, that argument goes like this. Uh, we need to respect the unique subjective experience of people who are scared by immigration and scared by the EU. I think this is an ironic argument, uh, given it's made by politicians and newspapers who routinely decry the rise of Generation Snowflake and tell us to get over ourselves every time we feel a little bit uncomfortable. And on a side note, would it not be fantastic if Brendan O'Neill, if Rod Little, if Nigel Farage occasionally turned around to their own voters and told them to get over themselves and grow up as often as they turn around to students who care about things like mental health and sexism and misogyny and racism and tell us to grow grow up and stop being special snowflakes. I think at a certain point, you need to disregard subjective experience and disregard vague feelings that our culture is under attack and prioritize instead the actual economic interests of real people. But my more substantive response to that is, why do I need to accept any of these arguments lying down? Why do we need to accept any of these arguments lying down? Why should we necessarily bow to sentiments with which we profoundly disagree? Why can't I argue back against Brexiteers that the most innovative country is the most diverse country, that the most moral country is the most welcoming country, and the most progressive country is the most open country? I actually know why, and this has been hinted at already. It's because the minute that any one of the 15 million people who voted remain uh, point out that perhaps the argument is not yet over, that perhaps there are discussions still to be had, the minute any one of the 15 million of us raise this point, we're called Ramonas, or we're called traitors, or we're told we hate Britain. And Tory councillors occasionally, and this was brilliant, um, wonder if we shouldn't be prosecuted for treason. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. If, if you want to call us traitors, if you want to take that to its extreme and say that we're scum and we don't deserve to be listened to, 
then you'd better get used to the fact that there are 15 million of us and we're not going anywhere. It's not moaning to criticize. It's not petty to argue about our future. In fact, I think arguing about our future makes us patriotic. Taking an interest in our future makes us patriotic. To love this country means not bowing to a government which drags us to the right and calls it democracy. To love this country means not bowing to a movement which uses racial slurs and calls it reclamation. And to love this country means not yielding to a demagoguery which treats facts as inconvenience and which treats dissent as treason. Ladies and gentlemen, a lot of the time when we stand up in this chamber, we argue for reasonably ridiculous propositions which we don't know much about and which we don't really believe in. Tonight is definitely not one of those nights. Possibly for the last time, I've never been prouder to oppose a motion in this chamber. <laughs> <laughs>